If you have ever been asked to visualise the quintessential 1920s flapper, chances are you may conjure up the image of Louise Brooks. With her sleek, dark bobbed hair and enduring beauty, the captivating Brooks's star shone briefly in the late 20s before she turned her back on Hollywood. Brooks could have been a mere footnote in film history if it had not been for the French film archivist Henri Langlois. When staging an exhibition at the Cinématique Française, Longlois erected two large banners outside the building, one of Falconetti in The Passion of Joan of Arc, the other of the almost forgotten Louise Brooks. When questioned about the inclusion of such an obscure American actress, Longlois retorted, There is no Garbo, there is no Dietrich, there is only Louise Brooks. A new generation of film lovers had rediscovered the actress, not only admiring her distinct style and beguiling beauty, but recognising her talent. Unlike the histrionic style of many of her contemporaries, Brooks's acting was strikingly naturalistic for the silent age, modern and frankly more palatable to later generations. A one-time Ziegfeld dancer, Brooks was fiery, candid, scandalous and furiously intelligent. She had an affair with Chaplin and quickly became notorious on the Manhattan party scene. However, Brooks was never enamoured with the falseness of Hollywood, the films she was making or even her own acting abilities and seemed intent on having fun and burning as many bridges as possible. Leaving her first husband, she struck up a romantic relationship with laundry magnet and the later controversial owner of the Washington Redskins, George Preston Marshall, who advised his young lover on her career. With the coming of sound, the studios apparently took advantage of some actors, refusing to increase salaries, and with this in mind, Brooks refused to renew her contract with Paramount. Under Marshall's guidance, she accepted an offer from Berlin. The Austrian director, G. W. Pabst, wanted her for the role of Lulu in Pandora's Box. She had never heard of the play or the director. Despite coming late to the film industry, Georg Wilhelm Pabst was a director of growing reputation and significance in Germany. He was 40 years old before he made his breakthrough film, The Joyless Street, starring Greta Garbo in her first prominent non-Swedish role. Pandora's Box is based on two plays by Franz Wiedekind, Air Spirit, published in 1895, and Pandora's Box, 1904. Along with his famous play, Spring Awakening, Wiedekind's work was highly controversial, resulting in censorship and outright bans. The essential theme in his work was the friction between the instinctive nature of sex against the ignorance of a hypocritical society. Wiedekind's work gained increasing admiration, perfectly embodying the expressionist theatre movement in the years before the war and this continued into the Weimar period when Wiedekind's analysis of society's relationship towards sex seemed to fit into an apparently liberated and curious time. Pabst had wanted to film Pandora's Box for a while, having first staged a version of Earth Spirit several years before. He was a follower of New Objectivity, which strived to focus on sobering reality. His work sympathised with those who were disenfranchised, and he wanted to reflect the social problems and hardships his audience faced, especially women. The character of Lulu had a previous screen incarnation in the form of Danish actress Asta Nielsen in 1923. However, to Pabst, Lulu was a more innocent, childlike character. She may be sensual and use her sexuality as a commodity, but she also was unaware of the power she wields. And at 42 years old, Nielsen just couldn't portray that vulnerability. Five years later, the 27-year-old unknown Marlene Dietrich came extremely close to signing on to play the title character, but unbeknownst to her, Pabs had been attempting to lure Louise Brooks over to Germany since he first saw the young starlet in Howard Hawks' A Girl in Every Port. So what could the director have seen in this beautiful young American who had only been in a handful of films? Pabst was an actor's director and is considered one of the earliest to really communicate with his actors, one-to-one -one at their level, and respecting their craft. He believed the right actor had to immerse themselves in a role, to be subtle, authentic, to tap into their emotions and to achieve a naturalism that helped the audience to empathise with Brooks. 
Pat saw a subtle, raw talent that hadn't met its full potential. In her book on Pandora's box, Pamela Hutchinson writes, Brooks was divertingly beautiful and appeared all the more so because she never seemed to simper or seek approval. In fact, her glistening eyes were constantly looking for the next good time. Pandora's Box is a story of Lulu, a beautiful innocent who accepts her brass sexuality with indifference and unwittingly causes the men and women that are captivated by her to self-destruct. The men that are bewitched by her include newspaper owner Dr. Sean, his son Alwa, a circus strongman, Rodrigo, her grotesque old patron, Shigog, as well as her lesbian friend, Countess Geshvich. They are lured to Lulu by her wide-eyed, carnal fire, but their lust inevitably destroys them all until the young woman herself is eventually murdered by Jack the Ripper. With the Lulu plays, Vidikind wanted to reprimand the society's hypocritical attitude towards sexuality. However, in the succeeding decades, attitudes towards the play and sex had altered dramatically. The sexual attitudes of returning soldiers from the front was at odds with the generation before. They were traumatised, relieved to be alive. Germany's economy was so broken that many women and men had to turn to prostitution. And with the relaxation of censorship laws, Many citizens felt freer than before to explore their sexuality. What was Brooks's portrayal of Lulu meant to say to the Thymar audience? As with most of Europe and America, the way society perceived women had started to change in Germany in the years after the First World War. Achieving suffrage in November 1918, the Weimar Republic was considered relatively advanced in terms of women's legal rights. However, the new woman didn't sit comfortably with what was traditionally a paternal society and this was very much reflected in the culture of the period. In the early part of the Weimar cinematic boom, men and their suffering, their scheming, their desires were the focus of the drama. The stars that came out of the period were mostly male. That's not to say there were no notable female actors, but the characters they portrayed were typified as virgins or vamps, created by a generation that had been emasculated and figuratively castrated by the loss of the war. In Germany, this representation of the sexes could have derived from the New Objectivity Movement, which positions itself as an artistic contrast to Expressionism born out of a sense of displacement that acknowledged the sense of possibilities with modernity as well as sexual and political freedom the movement also mourned the growing alienation of individuals and yearns for a simpler past some of the distrust of modernity came from perceived notions of the new woman and depicted man's attempt to tame her. Pabst's work is very much moulded out of new objectivity and we see this not only through his fascination with serious societal issues but also with his film technique. He pioneered smooth and visible editing, continuity, shot reverse shot, he didn't want to remind an audience they were watching a film in the hope they would be involved in what was actually happening. We do see some traits of the femme fatale with Lulu. Seductive, immoral, destructive. But with her coy smile and lack of awareness, Lulu is naive and has no shame. From the very start, we understand that Lulu is a rich man's paramour, yet her apartment is very much her space and she is self-sustaining. She is the hostess of the domain. It is she who pays the gas man. She who welcomes the men into the space and conducts them in a symphony of pleasure, happily satisfying them undepleted. Throughout the film, she serenely juggles those who are besotted with her, giving each a little piece of her time and affection. We may judge Lulu as a kept mistress, but we never see anyone other than the Countess give her money, and even then she immediately hands it to Alwa. The ambiguous Shigol, he has either been her first lover, pimp or father, immediately helps himself to the contents of her purse before demanding she dances as he plays the harmonica. Lulu gleefully obliges, as if she didn't really need an excuse, but is quickly and furiously reprimanded and stopped by the troll, thwarted for dancing to her own beat. Men are besotted by her, hate her, but feed off her. She is surrounded by men that behave abhorrently, that take no responsibility for their actions and ultimately place the blame for their downfall on her. 
Dr. Sean, introduced as a wealthy, respectable newspaper owner, behaves with a brutish, animalistic air. This powerful man believes Lulu is his for the taking, that she is disposable. Sean's son Alwa, who pretty much is a weak-willed rich boy, financially propped up by his father, also desires Lulu. In Weimar cinema, sons often rebelled against their fathers, but ultimately the father always knew best. This does not happen in Pandora's box. Both men will ultimately come to hate this woman for how she makes them feel. They despise themselves, so they loathe her. It's almost Freudian, which isn't surprising as Pabst had studied and recruited two of Freud's assistants during the filming of his previous film, Secrets of a Soul. With Pandora's Box, the story very much fits into the new objectivity fantasy of male domination. Yet, it is worth noting that Pabst's work often sympathises with women and he doesn't judge or condemn. Instead, he exhibits this dazzling, exciting new world and exposes the hypocrisy of those men who indulge themselves in it, but are also quick to condemn. Sean is respected in society. Yet it is accepted that he may use and abuse the young Lulu as he sees fit. When his son and Sean's respectable fiancée walk in on the couple, Lulu is defiant, almost amused. Well, the deflated, shamed and enfeebled Sean is sprawled out on the floor. She is the conqueror, yet what has she conquered? While Sean bemoans his doomed destiny, the juvenile Lulu impetuously spins and dances onto the stage, completely unaware that she too is plunging into the abyss. Pabst manipulated the situation further by playing upon Cortner's real-life animosity towards Brooks, which was apparently so severe he refused to communicate with the actress, and even bruised her arms after shaking her in a scene. According to Brooks, Pabst encouraged the actress' disposition to hate and back away from each other, and thus preserved their energy for the camera. He used an actor's true feelings to add depth and breadth and power to his performance. The role of Dr. Sean combines sexual passion with an equally passionate desire to destroy me. Sean lusts after Lulu and he despises himself due to his weakness, and by extension he despises Lulu. The audience are visually reminded that Lulu's inner fire could be snuffed out at any time as she is regularly encompassed by larger dominating men, be it as she breezily lies exposed as the brutish Sean looms over her, or as she playfully swings herself while hanging off the symbol of masculine aggression, the coiled muscular arm. We love to watch her, and so did Pabst. In Pandora's box, he rarely focuses on Brooks's body, opting to capture her energy, her smile and her sparkling eyes, the windows to her soul. She is often an extreme close-up, her head filling the frame, her essence barely suppressed. The combination of Brooks and Pabst brought a new vigour to the close-up. The director once said, in close-up, you must understand what you are acting, otherwise the audience will know. Pabst films Brooks like a goddess, as Lottie Eisner would one day describe her. She is like a pagan idol, tempting, glittery with spangles, feathers and frills. Brooks was encouraged to give a natural performance, yet Pabst employs chiaroscuro lighting which illuminated her like a preternatural being. Her helmet-like hair, her satin dress and especially her eyes sparkle and gleam. Light lures people, Lulu lures people and men are drawn to Lulu, yet ultimately want to diminish that light. On her wedding night, Lulu gazes at herself in the mirror, admiringly undisturbed by the hedonistic behaviour of some of the guests and her new husband's growing distress. Her old friends and stepson have propositioned her. Without her encouragement or reciprocation, treating them all with a detached amusement rather than impassioned. She is luminous yet encompassed by a foreboding expressionistic shadow from where the ominous figure of Sean emerges, commanding she kill herself. She is confused, feels no shame, as Sean's animalistic aggression dwarves Lulu. As we've seen throughout the film, we focus on his physicality. His broad back visually smothers Brooks's face. Suddenly, Sean's back stiffens. A wisp of gun smoke slowly ascends between her and her new husband. We focus on Lulu's eyes, confused, horrified, almost pitying. In the next act, Lulu is on trial for the murder of Sean. 
The defence argues that Lulu is an unfortunate with a tragic past, unfairly blamed for an awful accident. The majority of women in the court applaud, only to be silenced by the men. The prosecutor, after momentarily being enchanted with the defendant's dazzling smile, demands the death penalty. Not so much for the flimsy murder charge, but because Lulu, a sinner, lures men in. She is Pandora. She brings evil upon them. The enraged Countess publicly defends her friend, and when that fails, she coordinates Lulu's dramatic escape from the courthouse. Special mention should be given to Alice Roberts as the Countess, playing one of the earliest portrayals of a screen lesbian. Robert's performance is heartfelt and sympathetic. The Countess is one of Lulu's many admirers, but she is the only one that does not ask or take anything from her. She is loyal, strongly empathises with Lulu. After escaping the court, Lulu and her group have been forced to hide out on a sleazy gambling boat and brothel. She is blackmailed and sold off to a client. The Countess once again comes to her aid and ultimately sacrifices herself to protect her beloved friend. With Shigol and Alwa as company, Lulu travels to a bleak, dark and foggy London. Shigol immediately schemes like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He has manipulated the innocent Lulu throughout the film and continues to do so in this squalid domain. It is up to her to keep them alive by turning to the streets where she will meet her end. She still tries to maintain her home as she did at the start. It is she and only she that attempts to fix the broken skylight. The gas lamp struggles to glow, recalling the presence of the gas man in the opening scenes. Lulu still passes out the drinks. In this final act, we are introduced to Jack the Ripper. Not played as a dastardly Victorian villain, but as a haunted hollow-eyed drifter. New Objectivity seemed obsessed with the subject of Roost Murder, murder committed in a sexual frenzy. There had been several notorious vicious cases throughout the Weimar period, like Fritz Harman, Peter Curtin, and Karl Grossman, that not only became media sensations, but the subjects of visual art in the works of Rudolf Schlichter, Heinrich Daveringhausen, and Otto Dix, the latter of which identified with such killers so much he created a self-portrait of himself mutilating a prostitute. In her book, Lossmord, Sexual Murder in Weimar, Germany, Maria Tatar theorises that the emasculated German men were the former rank-and-file soldiers that positioned themselves as victims or martyrs who sacrificed for the fatherland and then were portrayed by the women who stayed at home and supposedly took over the labour force. Women became the enemy. You repair the trauma by killing the feminine. Gustav Diesel's sensitive performance definitely taps into new objectivity's fascination with sex killers. The sets and the use of light and shadow seem suitably grim, yet through the eyes of Jack the Ripper we once again see the light of Lulu's soul. Her shining eyes remind the killer of the shine from his knife and prompt Jack to throw his knife away. There seems to be a genuine affection between Lulu and her killer. Having already established that Jack has no money to offer, Lulu brings him back to her garret purely out of compassion because she likes him. She is comfortable with this man. The two are at ease together, tranquil despite their dire circumstances. Behind the camera, Brooks and Diesel enjoyed a brief romance. The actress felt that Pabs had anticipated this to help her performance, having also destroyed her favourite suit, then making her wear it in the final scenes to make her feel suitably miserable. Brooks actually wrote, it is in the worn and filthy garments of the streetwalker that Lulu feels passion for the first time, comes to life that she may die. It is Christmas Eve and she is about to receive the gift that has been her dream since childhood, death by a sexual maniac. Lulu is warm and open in these final moments. She offers Jack a kiss without expecting anything but the possibility of love. While embracing the gas lamp flickers, illuminating the bread life and Jack's homicidal compulsions are awoken. Lulu's inner light dims in his memory and must be extinguished. Like all the men throughout the film, he will take from her the last thing she has to offer, her life. Evoking Sean's death, Lulu is obscured by a masculine bat as the knife is plunged into her. 
Brooks apparently thought we should have seen the grisly details of the Ripper murder, but Pabs doesn't want to punish Lulu. And neither should we, it's more of a tragic inevitability. Pandora's Box was a critical and commercial failure. Outside Germany, the film was hacked to pieces by the censors, rendering it confusing and suffering greatly as a result. According to Brooks, at the premiere, moviegoers were hostile, with a young film fan shouting, That is the American girl who's playing our German Lulu! Critics were as disparaging of the film. It took decades for the film's relevancy to become apparent, with Lottie Eisner believing it one of the most significant films of the decade. One of Eisner's colleagues had been less favourable. Louise Brooks cannot act. She does not suffer. She does nothing. As negative as this sounds, this comment may have secretly pleased Pabst. The large emotional theatrical benchmark for acting on screen was of no interest to him. He wanted the subtle, the restrained and a raw realism. Brooks claimed that she did not act throughout Pandora's box. That she was Lulu. And Pabst knew this. Whatever the director saw in Brooks, he decided that he wanted to bring that startling persona onto the screen once again. And within a year, he had the opportunity to do so.